now that we've got our 100 grams of A mixed in, we're going to take, uh, I'm going to take whole new cups and we're going to do 100 grams of B. Yes, sir. Yep. Yeah, when I do large castings, it can take me up to 25 minutes sometimes before I get back to, to them. I mean, I wouldn't just like let it sit overnight, but yeah. About three months per the manufacturer's instructions. I don't recommend refrigerating it because that can, uh, it can introduce moisture to it. Um, and moisture is the enemy of all resin casting. So, um, you know, what I do is I have, uh, I've got my garage and then the room right when I walk into the garage is my laundry room. And then I just have my resin on the shelf there instead of like clothes or stuff I really need. <laughs> yeah, who needs that much laundry detergent? <laughs> so how does it fare in the, in the heat? Uh, um, so the reason that I cast the way this, the reason I teach this manner is because this is the way that I had to uh, learn how to cast because of Texas temperature. So um, our, the perfect reaction time for mixing your alumilite is 95 to 100 degrees. So if you're already in a 92 degree shop, it's only going to take it seconds to get up to the perfect temperature, which is another reason why I leave it in my laundry room because it's always you know 70 degrees in my house. So it kind of gives you a fighting chance. Um, per Lumalite's proper instructions, it's a clear cup. You take your A and B, you mix it together until it goes from cloudy to clear. Then you separate it, you introduce your mica, and then you mix. Well, on a 100 degree summer day, we don't have I can't do it. So what I, this is how I came up with it, and it's very successful. And this is how I've been teaching people for the last three years how to do it. Zero time. <laughs> so um, now, right now, we've got three cups of B, 100 grams of each cup, clear, and then our A is already colored. That's why I always mix them separately. So now we know what's A and what's B. I always mix my A into B because um, if you are going to have a little bit more than, of one than the other, it's better to have a little bit B. Um, but at the end of the day, they're both 50-50 ratios, so we're going to be close enough that we're going to have a really good, really good cast. Um, only key notes I'm going to tell you guys is once I start this, this is when the, you guys are going to see two things. You're going to see how much time you really have, and you're going to see, um, you're going to see me scramble and maybe spill something. So it's going to be awesome. <laughs> so the goal is to introduce them as uh, soon as possible to each other, so meaning you don't want to spend two or three minutes on one color and then mix to the next. So you just want to kind of pour them all three as soon as you kind of can, and then you can always come back and stir them later. It doesn't, although um, they always, B is the hardener, so it's one of those, it's always better to have a little bit more B than A, so I always pour my A into B if that makes any sense, because there's some residue always in A. Oh, oh. So the inside of the cup always has a little mm -hmm. residue on Yep, yeah, there's a guy named Zach Higgins um, that does the Dunkin' Junk. So if you ever notice, um, if you ever really watch him, Zach always pours 2 grams or 2.2 grams more in his A than his B because he pours his A into B, and he knows, he's done enough casting that he knows that he always has 2.2 .2 grams of A left in his cups, and that's how he gets it. That's a, you don't necessarily have to do that. You'll get a really good mix if you don't, um, but he's just being precise. There's a reason he wears the white doctor's coat on it. So right now, it's um, you're just stirring, guys. You want to stir, stir, stir. You cannot over stir your resin, but you can under stir it. So it's very important that you um, stir. And don't break your popsicle stick like I just did. So.
scrape the sides of the cup, make sure you get a good mixture. So now that we've uh, given them all a decent beginning stir, you do have time. We do have a couple minutes. If you're going to notice, I'm going to constantly stir. I'm not going to just walk away and go get a cup of coffee right now or anything. So you want to make sure you have a fresh stir. Take your IR thermometer, which is infrared thermometer, and you're going to read it. So right now we're at 87.6 degrees with the silver. We'll give. No. Eighty nine degrees with the red. It's heating up and boiling right now. It's it's heating up right now, yep. So we're gonna slowly raise the temperature. So the uh, sweet spot that I found for alumilite is between ninety five degrees and ninety eight degrees. That's where you're gonna get the color separation. I just kinda bring these in here, kinda show you. You can see how there's drastic color separation between the colors, and um, that'll make sure that you have that color separation. Now, there's a lot of guys that can do it by feel. I was a mechanic um, in my previous life, all right, in and out of high school, so I can't feel the temperature heat up in the cup. So that's where we've got the IR thermometer. You can cast it sooner. If you don't want to wait for it to get to 95 degrees, if it's at 90 degrees, you can. However, the more you stir it, or the more you mix it with your popsicle stick, is the more uh, muddied it'll get. There are guys that use that to their advantage. For instance, you go back to the colors. If you mix yellow and red, but you mix it at 88 or 90 degrees, where they come together, it will make orange because they're going to bleed into each other a little bit. I can't even have paper towels on my table. And you're going to trust me with the drill? <laughs> yeah, no, I always recommend the popsicle stick because um, I, I, I already spill enough, and I feel like if I took a power drill to this, it would just be an even bigger mess. So we're at 96 degrees. Oh, 97 degrees. We're good. So give it a quick little stir. Take the edge of the cup. One of the little tricks that I forgot to show you guys, but I'll show it to you real quick on silver, is if you take your resin and you let it rain down on the popsicle stick, that'll tell you if you have enough coverage. If you can see through the resin and see the popsicle stick, then you don't have enough mica in there, and you just need to make sure that you're back painting any project that you have or you're going to have some transparency. So right here, this is how you pour it. Everybody pours their molds a little different, or their blocks a little differently. Good one, thank you. Um, everyone, everyone pours it a little bit differently. It doesn't matter if you want to pour it fast, slow, you can mix them together, you can pull it real tall. Everybody does it a little bit differently, and that's what kind of makes it great. Once it's done and you've got them in there, you can take a popsicle stick. You can go, you can uh, just make, you know, just do swirls like this. You can sign your name, draw Snoopy, whatever you want to do. The more you stir it, or the more you mix it, the, uh, the more muddied it'll get. So there is kind of a fine line between it. Just take your lid off your pressure pot. Oops, sorry. Drop this in the pressure pot. Oh. Place gently. And fill that rod off. And we're going to tighten our pressure pot. One thing to note is you want to always tighten the arms across from each other. You never want to go in a clockwise or counterclockwise uh, motion. You always want to go across because going across will equalize the pressure downward and you won't, have, uh, you won't have the problem with the lid sealing. I am going to introduce air. We're just going to do 45 PSI. Another thing to help you give success is going to be this desiccant filter. Um, desiccant filters are an inline dryer. They're going to collect moisture. I didn't seal the lid tight enough. So we're just going to let it slowly air out.
and then I'll read that. This you do. So Lumilite Clear, you do need the pressure pot at the end of the day. Yep. So Lumilite Clear has uh, minimal shrinkage. So if you want to pass these blocks around, you can. So if you notice, there'll always be shrinkage in the corners. You can minimize that shrinkage in the. Oh, I was like. Um, you, you can always um, minimize the shrinkage in the corners by heating your mold a little bit. I don't recommend heating your mold to 200 degrees by any means. Um, you know, I don't, you know, 80 or 90 is what I would recommend. On YouTube, you see all these guys with Those are for epoxy resins. Those are for epoxy. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so epoxy, you have that time where the air will come up to the top and settle, and then you just want to, you can flame kiss it to pop the bubbles. Correct. So what you're doing when you're putting resin under pressure is you're actually taking those air bubbles and you're reducing them to a size that it's no longer visible by the naked eye, is what you're doing. The air bubble's still there, you just can't see it with the visible eye. So normally 45 PSI is what I recommend for everything. Yep. You can have really great success with um, even hybrid casting at 40. 45 psi. Depending on what you're casting, if you had something that had like a lot of smaller voids, raising the temperature up to 60 would definitely benefit you. However, I would never recommend taking a um, pressure pot and g exceeding its max operating pressure. So there are a variety of pressure pots. Um, you have um, Harbor Freight is kind of has the cheap one that everybody starts off with. Um, you know, you, with the coupon, I think you can get it for 80 bucks. Convert it. Um, one thing I'll tell you guys is, uh, man, it's just slowly going. Um, <clears throat> one thing I'll tell you guys, it's fine. <laughs> it's, uh, one, uh, one thing I'll tell you is that there are companies now like TCP Global that has a resin casting pod. It's this blue one right here, except it's designed for resin casting. So you just have a, a, a solid lid. There's no mixer hole for the mixer. Pressure pots, or paint pots is what we're doing, and we're converting them to do resin casting is actually not what they were meant to do, okay? So a lot of them will have a big bulky regulator that's got like nine or 12 fittings on it. You do not need the regulator, okay? First step I'm gonna tell you is to take the regulator off of it. That's just multiple areas for you to have air leakage. All that regulator is there to do is for when you connect your, your compressor up to, with 120 PSI, it's to maintain that the pot stays at 45 so you can even spray with your paint nozzle. You do not need that for resin casting. What you're doing is you're taking your pressure pot or your paint pot and you're converting it into an air tank. It's basically what you're doing. So um, take the regulator off. The least amount of connections you have obviously minimizes your chances of uh, leakage. Um, if you're just getting started, the Harbor Freight Pot is a great cost-effective pot. Okay, uh, 45 psi is all you need to cast. I don't recommend it taking it to its max pressure, which is 60 psi. Um, if you want to step up from a Harbor Freight pot, there's TCP Global and California pressure pots. Um, those are both great companies. They both are very, that's a TCP Global. Um, they're both that size. They're both kind of blue. They both look the same. And then if you want to go one step up, so the Harbor Freight one's about $80 to $100. The TCP Global is um, right around, two, I think, 286 is what I just bought the one that we're giving away in Ohio next weekend. Um, for um, the one, if you want to go one step above it, there's Binks. Now, Binks is the only like stamped rated pot in America for its pressure rating. So, if you're one of those guys that like wants the rated, wants the rating and everything, I believe the two and a half gallon Binks, which is half that size, is on sale for 448 right now. So it really depends on, it really depends on, um, you know, you guys. It's just like going and asking, I could go and ask everybody in this room, you know, what's your favorite table saw, right? And how many, you know. What'd they tell me at SWAT? Who was at SWAT? Somebody told me you can ask woodwork, you can ask six woodworkers 
a question and get seven answers because there's always one to tell you to. So it's one of those, everybody has their own point. My recommendation if you're getting into resin casting and especially if you don't know um, much about it, find a friend that's local that is doing it. Believe it or not, there's a lot of us around here. Um, however, if you don't have anybody or can't find anybody local, start with the Harbor Freight Pot. You're not building a bomb, okay? You're building an air tank. This right here is a prime example of what happens if you do not get a good seal. It's going to hiss at you. This is a great example of what it's going to do. As long as your arms are on and tight, this is what it does. Do you have any thoughts on that? So carbide's a really great, really great tool. You can have the same, ro um, same results with the hardened steel. So w when it comes down to it, guys, it has to do with two things, sharpness and angle. So if you guys are turning something, this is, it gets very um, obvious when you're switching real quick. So if you switch from like a polyester resin blank to a alumilite blank to an epoxy blank, it becomes very, very obvious that the change of pitch of your tool is important. You, even if you're just using a standard carbide tool, um, like for me, I know that if I'm doing polyester resin, I need to drop my tool rest like half an inch lower than where it, I where it would be at if I was turning alumilite. I just know that because I've done it so much. So it has to do with a lot of the, the angle in which you're turning at. You know, I grew up, uh, you know, I grew up with the old school. I think my shop teacher was like 75 years old. And when we were laid, he was like, it's an extension of your arm. You have to be 90 degrees, no different, you know, so. And, you know, and it's just, it's not, that's not the case. You actually can adjust your tool rest and your tool to give you better effects. So if you're having a blank that's real chippy and it's just chipping, I definitely recommend raise your tool rest a half an inch, kind of bring your tool up or bring your tool down a little bit and play with it a little bit. And you might, it might actually self-solve itself. But I've heard nothing but good things about the negative rake on the easy wood tools. I just personally haven't used them. So you get along fine without them? Correct. But I do use carbide. So I, I, still, use, uh, I still use my three-quarter inch roughing gouge to get everything round and then I'll go to my carbide. So, yep, it doesn't matter what I do. If it's a watch parts blank that I created or if it's a all resin blank, it doesn't matter if it's polyester resin or alumilite or epoxy. If it's a block or if it's in that mold shape, I will turn it around with my three quarter inch gouge, set that down, and then I'll go to my carbide. Um, just micro mesh pads. So there's mi micro mesh pads or Zona paper. They use one the other. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's several different stage grits. Like Novus has the three-stage finish, and then you've got Yorkshire grit and stuff. Um, I always just mic. So keep in mind you're polishing something, you're not sanding something. So when you get it off the lathe, you're going to sand it up until, I always sand mine up until about 1,200. And then I go into wet sanding it with the micro mesh. Now, keep in mind that's polishing. That's not sanding. So you don't need to, like, arm wrestle it is what I call it, where you're just, like, shoving it to the blank. You don't need to do that. You just need to gently kind of run, run the pad over it, whether it's a pin blank or a bottle stop or whatever. And then you're going to go up. And then I finish out with Meguiar's plastic polish. I mean, it's like Meguiar's, uh, it's like X or something like that. It's a little black bottle. It's like $8 a bottle, and I think I'm going on two years with mine, and I'm sure I'm not even a third of the way through it. Um, I just will, I will uh, micro mesh up to the 12,000, dry it off, I'll hit it with that uh, Meguiar's, and then done. 12,000 micro mesh. You technically could immediately turn it. I do not recommend it. Um, so with Alumilite, I recommend you waiting the three to five days if you can, you can turn it, for instance, we could cut the block up and we could turn it in two hours. I mean, that's no problem. Um, where you're really going to notice it affects it is during the polishing. You're not going to be able to get a really good polish because it hasn't fully cured yet. So it does take a week to cure. Um, it's normally not a concern. Um, it's normally not a concern because you're buying somebody else's blanks. So, for instance, like, I guess SWAT was last weekend and it's just been time slowing by or... But I, I cast those at SWAT. Those are fully cured at this point. So I could cut them up. And you can cut them up. As soon as the block col cools down, you can cut them up. But I'd recommend waiting a couple days to turn, at least three days to turn. What's your sources for Illinois? 
Um, I get I buy all my alumilite at Turntex. So um, Curtis Seebeck is a wealth of knowledge. He helped develop the develop it. Um, to be honest with you guys, he ships UPS, and since he's in San Marcos, it's practically overnight shipping, and it only costs sixteen bucks. So um, it's just one of those, you know, kind of hard to beat the whole one day and it's at your door. Especially when I forget and it's two o'clock in the afternoon and I have it at my door at two o'clock the next day. So some people might be too. I'm not promising you it's it's overnight. I'm just saying you that I'm in Anna or McKinney. And when I buy it from Curtis and he ships it that day, it's always the next day with UPS for me. So it's just the quicker shipping just because of location. Correct. Yeah, ab absolutely. So if I would have done this with a clear color, so what she's asking, if instead of putting blue in here, it would be clear. You would literally have silver, clear, green, silver, or green, clear. Everywhere that you'd see blue would be clear. Um, a lot of bottle stopper makers and bowl makers do that. It's a really cool effect. Is that clear stay clear for a long time? Or I know some resins tend to yellow. All resins will yellow. All resins will yellow. So in my experience, Illumilite takes about um, two to three years in my experience. Um, that being said, just because if you cast something a couple two years ago and it's yellowed, don't be afraid to turn it because you turn it so thin, you might not even be able to notice it. Um, you know, epoxies will tell you that they have UV resistors in them. I don't necessarily know what that means, but they will yellow over time. If you introduce mica to it or a colorant to it, you will you'll never notice. I guarantee you'll never notice. No, it's not good. Guys, that's it, really.